Welcome to The One Inside, an internal family systems podcast. I'm your host, Tammy Sollenberger. I'm excited that you and all of your parts have taken time to be with me and all of my parts. If you are a coach, a client, a therapist, if you are in business or education, and you're curious about the IFS model, you are in the right place. Now, let's see what happens on today's podcast. Hey everyone, if you're listening in real time, then it's the beginning of the holiday season, and I thought this was a fantastic episode to start us off. It's my birthday, actually, December 20th, so you are probably, as I am, in the midst of hurried and stress and a million things to do. I also have parts anticipating being around family, around lots of extended family and travel and lots of good things, but lots of stress. And I've already noticed, which I found super ironic after, it takes me about a week to edit these. And so I was in the midst of editing this amazing podcast. I found myself eating a lot of sugary treats. And I'm realizing as I talk to Barbara about this, I will use sugary treats because they're amazing, especially at the holidays. Heavens to Betsy, there's sugary treats galore. And there's also part of me that has this scarcity mindset of like, it's the only time of year to eat the sugary treats and you need to eat them all now. And they're just really yummy. Barbara talks about we can have, we have a struggle with food, that we can have parts that have problems with calming. And I know that I have parts that have used food to calm. And I'm realizing that, especially at the holidays, food calms my nervous system. And that's what I'm really needing at this time of year. Barbara also is offering two of the essays. We talk about one that she sent me. So she has two essays. One is called um, The Making Peace with Your Food and Body Approach, How to Overcome Emotional, Habitual, and Overeating. That's the one that I read and I asked her lots of questions about in this podcast. And then she sent me another one afterwards called Pants Too Tight. The Making Peace with Your Food and Body Solution. I just want to, I'm going to leave you with this and then let the podcast begin. Happy holidays. I hope everyone's doing great. I have a super fun podcast that if all things go well, I will put out on New Year's Eve. So you'll have that to look forward to. But I want to leave you with this. This is in the Pants Too Tight essay. So I don't know if I said this already, but if you email her, she will send these two essays to you for free. So just as a listener of the One Inside podcast, email her and let her know that you heard her on the podcast and she will send you these articles. So definitely do that. Her email, which is written in the show notes, so you don't have to write this down, but her email is Barbara L. Holtzman, H-O-L-T-Z-M-A-N at gmail.com. Barbara L. Holtzman at gmail.com. Okay, this is what she says in the article. So I decided to practice what I preach. I became curious about the cravings. My inner coach, it's a part, right? The inner coach started asking the questions that I ask clients. How would eating the cashew butter help? She's talking about how she would have a daily tablespoon of cashew butter and realizing that that morphed into two or three kind of heaping teaspoons of cashew butter. So she asks this part, how would eating the cashew butter help? Do you desire the taste and the texture? In which case, mindfully eating one spoonful should satisfy. Does that make sense? If I'm, if I'm desiring the taste and the texture, then I should be able to have one spoonful, eat that slowly, mindfully, and that would satisfy. Or does the need feel urgent and compulsive? And if that's the case, there's an emotional need for comfort or distraction and no amount will satisfy. That's interesting, yes? 
She asked the apart this too. Is there anything else that would make you feel better? If the urge is still strong and nothing else will alleviate this feeling, eat it slowly, mindfully, with great pleasure, allowing it to soothe you just enough to be satisfied. It's so good. It's all of that for an hour. I hope you love it. Happy holidays. I'll talk to you soon. So why don't we just start with uh, where you are in the world and tell us what you see when you look out a window. Well, before my window, I see my dead bonsai, but I love the shape of it so much that I don't want to get rid of it. (laughs) Aww. And there's no way to resurrect it? Oh, no. Oh, no. It it is dead, but it is still very beautiful. And so it's sort of like watching, looking at a tree in winter. Oh, yeah. (laughs) And outside outside my uh, window, I see my shed and, and trees, and I see my composter can't see water, but if I was to stand up, I might see a little bit of water. Oh, so you're close to the water? I'm close to the water. Um, there's on one, one view, I can see a little bit of river and another view, I can see this much of, um, of ocean. Oh, <laughs> and Barbara is using her hands like maybe like, uh, how would we describe how much of ocean to tell um, listeners how much of the ocean you can see? Very little. <laughs> but still, you can see it. And yeah. you're in Rhode Island. Are you in Rhode Island? I'm in Rhode Island. I'm in southern Rhode Island near the beaches. Ah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh. What's the temperature there today? Oh, it's probably the same as it is with you. So it's, uh, I think it's actually up to 50. And Yeah, it's actually not bad today. It's sunny. It's a little breezy, but. Yeah. I don't think it's 50. I think it's 30-ish, but. No. Really? I don't know. It was 30 okay. this morning when I was in the car. It was 30, but okay. that was this morning. Okay. I'll take 50, though. I'll take that. That's not bad. <laughs> That's better than what was it the other day, 18 or something? Yep. It was a, a prelude. <laughs> to oh, yes. I <laughs> uh, can't take it. Why don't you start by telling, so you and I met with, uh, at this work, an IFS workshop that some people call 1.5, like, so you do, l- l- so some right. people we, do level it was mas- one. Mastering the basics. Mastering the basics, and it was, that was, it was like every Friday, like once a month for like eight, was it eight? Yep, sessions? eight sessions, yep, yep, with Paul yeah. Newstead and, and Pamela Gabe. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm pronouncing her name correctly, but they were terrific. They were fantastic. Yeah. yeah, I think for anybody who is feeling stuck and not using their training, it's it's a wonderful way to really get the important pieces. Yeah, yeah, I like that too. Um, yeah, because after level one, you're sort of like, um, yeah, yeah. I thought it was I thought it was really great. So we met there, and I knew that you had written this book, mm-hmm. and it's a subject that's near and dear to my heart. Um, and I, as soon as I decided to do a podcast, you were one of the first people I wanted to talk to because I was like, I this is just a subject that means a lot to me, and I know it means a lot to a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah so why don't you tell everybody about your book and um just the title of your book and then i'll ask i have lots of questions okay great that makes it a lot easier yeah good um tell everyone the name of your book okay the name of the book is conscious eating conscious living and the subtitle is a practical guide to making peace with food and your body yeah and i wrote it in 2001 and then i revised it in 2005. And basically it, what was, what was the reason I wrote it is because I was, I had started doing these groups, uh, making peace with food and your body. And I started doing them when I still worked at an HMO. I worked at Harvard, Harvard health, and then it became Harvard Pilgrim. And then when I started private practice, I decided to do them. And so I did these 12 week recontractable groups on and every group I would, would be didactic. I would be doing some teaching. We would do some experiential like conscious eating. Uh, we would do guided imagery we would, um, and we would do sharing. And then I would give them um, experiments to try in between the groups. And one summer I was just driven to write a manual for the groups. And then it sort of, continued to grow. And then I was going to do a 
cassette back then. It was a cassette. <laughs> yeah, I remember those days. days. Yeah. Right. And there was a woman at a, an independent bookstore who really helped guide me in doing this. And she said, no, 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 do a CD. Wow. And she was the first bookstore that carried the book. And basically it was, it was my whole journey and also where I was trying to go to um, in my own work. Yeah. Uh, in, my, in my own relationship with food and my body, because I couldn't be doing this work if this was not my own history, you know, my own, my own challenge. Yeah. So are you open to talk a little bit about your own history and challenge? Oh, with, sure. Yeah. With food <laughs> sure. and body image stuff. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> okay. So my, I was one of those solid kids, you know, I was chunky. Um, and my, Parents did not like, um, they wanted somebody who, they wanted a, a daughter who was thin. Mm-hmm. And um, so I remember it always being an issue that they would watch what I ate. The first time, my first diet actually, so, so I was, I didn't feel like I could have what I wanted, but not, and I would sneak food. I was, you know, definitely a sneaker. And um, because, of course, when you're deprived and you can't have what you want, you're going to go find it some way. And I started working at the age of 12 and babysitting and going door to door. I would sell Christmas cards. And, and so whatever money I made, I would use for food. Mm. I wasn't getting it at home. Not food. I would use it for sweets. Yeah. And um, then at 16 was when I went did my first diet. And I did a, um, uh, the Stillman's diet and lost a lot of weight. And, um, and it came from my father making a deal with me that he would send me to this program that I wanted to go to if I would lose weight. And so I did. And of course, I couldn't sustain it because I was 130 pounds and that's not my natural body weight. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we know now that what happens, I mean, I didn't understand any of this at the time, but we know now that what happens when we... When we, depro- when we eat less, when we restrict, our body thinks it's starving. And so it will, the, the, um, it, the metabolism will slow down in order to make sure that we don't starve. Mm. So once I started eating normally again, of course, I gained weight back and I started that whole diet in yo mm, Right. And I did that for many years um, until when I was in my 30s, I started reading Janine Roth and Susie Orbach. Right. Do you, did you ever read Susie Orbach's stuff? She no, wrote, I've read Janine Roth's stuff a bunch. I love her. Yes. Yeah. She's great. She's great. And Susie Orbach wrote this, these books, uh, Fat is a Feminist Issue, one and t- uh, two, and they were wonderful. And what I got from both of those books is that the food had been the best thing that I could have used. It was a way to try to manage the food. And what I say to my clients and my groups is food is not the problem. Food is our attempted solution to the problem. Yeah. And when I got that from them, and it helped to re- relieve the shame, yeah. and yes. I was able to stop the dieting. That goes to my like probably 10th question, which is that idea that you said from, so I read the article that you sent me and I listened to mm-hmm. the videos. You have two fantastic videos on your website. So I recommend everyone go to the website Thank and you. check out the videos. And they are They're welcome great. to get, and they are welcome to get a copy of my article. Great. How would they go about doing that? Would they just email okay, you? They, or? They'd email me. So okay. um, at Barbara at BarbaraHoltzman.net. I also suggest people go to my website, first of all, to see the videos and also some, some of the writings that I've done about this approach and to look at my book Yeah. Uh, to see if that, that feels right for them. But I have an article that I've actually, I, I've been sending out because it's, it's really an overview of the whole, my whole approach. Yeah. I mean, I, the article made me really just want to buy your book, <laughs> but it was great oh, because I was like, that's how, that's how I felt. And I hope, I hope that listeners, um, that's how they feel too, is that like, okay, I just want more of this. I want more of you mm-hmm. and I want more of this because mm-hmm. it was like, um, it really just spoke to me. So one of the things that you said that I think speaks to IFS is this idea that food, that the part was using food as medicine. And yes. it was the only, the only resource available to this part yes. of me. So can well you talk said. a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, food is, 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 you can get it. You can, you can sneak it in your own house. It's easy enough to find some. Um, I used to, you know, take my babysitting money and walk to the corner store, 
And it's, and it works so quickly. Yeah, yes. I mean, I remember one time, this was years later, uh, I was really distressed and I didn't have as many tools at that point. And I remember driving around and looking for something to alleviate. And I saw a CVS and I ran into the CVS and grabbed from the, from the, the candy counter. I grabbed a Kit Kat bar. I was waiting in line to pay for it. I couldn't wait until I got to actually pay for it. I ripped it open and I took a bite and I could feel my nervous system calming down. Yes. Yeah. It works so well. And what I say to clients and I think this is really important, is you don't have to give up food. Mm. And if the food is the best thing that you can find in this particular moment, and you are so distressed, use it. But feel it calming you. And then the emotional eating experience won't turn into a binge. It only turns into a binge when we don't savor it and feel the calming from it mm. and, and don't shame ourselves for it. You know, and, and to say to ourselves, I'm sorry that you're so upset that food is the only thing that's going to help right now mm-hmm. and let it help. Yeah, that that sounds like revolutionary, that idea that like, OK, if that part of me says the only thing that's going to help is that Kit Kat bar, yeah. you get the Kit Kat par, bar. Yeah. And so you have these ideas around pausing and taking mm. a couple deep breaths. So tell mm. me about if I'm going to eat the Kit Kat par, bar. And can I eat a king size one? <laughs> you probably won't need the king size one. I don't know. Okay, so I'm I'm gonna challenge everyone to this. Okay, if you buy the king size one, you're probably gonna eat the king size one. So I used to do this. Um, you know, when people when people say to me, you know, I, I need three cookies. How do you know you're going to need three? There's a three cookie rule in the family. The family had a three cookie <laughs> rule and that's what it was. Right. And my thing is, okay, you can have the three cookies, but let's start with one. So I'm going to tell you another story. And this is um, uh, the story about me and um, Dunkin' Donuts cookies. So they used to make these little cookies. They were like, I don't know, maybe three or four bites and they were 35 cents. So that really appealed to me too. And I was addicted to them. So every time I would pass a Dunkin' Donuts, and there's a lot of Dunkin' Donuts in Rhode Island. Every time I would pass a Dunkin' Donuts, I would want to pull in. And I finally made a deal with myself because that was not, I mean, I was, I was reacting to the stimulus, not to whether I really wanted it. So it wasn't a choice. Hmm. So I decided I was wanted to, to make it a choice. So whenever I would see, uh, the deal I had was whenever I'd see the Dunkin' Donuts sign, I would check in very quickly on a scale of zero to 10, how much do you want it right now? And if it was a seven or above, I'd pull in. And if it wasn't, i say, you can wait until you really want it. Okay, so then the deal was, um, I preferred the chocolate chip, but the oatmeal raisin's a little bit healthier. So if I would be satisfied with the oatmeal raisin, get the oatmeal raisin. But if I wouldn't be satisfied with it, I'd feel deprived because I hadn't had the, cho- the chocolate chip, then get the chocolate chip. Okay, so here was the deal too. You go in and you get one. Now, I wanted to get two just in case, right? <laughs> you know, understand that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> At least. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd only get one. And then I would sit in the car and the deal was that I had to eat it slowly and savor it. Mm. And um, so no driving, no reading, which I really, I mean, I love to read while I eat, right? But no, not when you're having a treat. Because then mm. you get the full satisfaction from the, from the cookie. Yeah. And then change the taste in your mouth. Because when you have sweet, the sweet taste in your mouth, I don't know if you've found this, that often it makes you want more sweets. So I would have some water. And then check in again. Do you want a second cookie? How much do you want it? If you wanted a second one, go get it. You know? Yeah. And that's almost like you're, it sounds like yourself is checking in with that part and being like, okay, you know, sort of Uh even like a little, like there's a little younger part. Um, You talked a little bit about habit and I thought, okay, I wonder if, if the Duncan story is also like my habit is 
I see a Duncan's, I go over. And yep. so is that part of like the zero to 10 is to kind of stop that habit? Yes. Yes. Okay. Take a pause. I send a pause. A, okay. The pause is so, so important. In fact, I'm, I'm, I'm just finishing up a three session group, um, making peace with food, your body and yourself group. And I sent them a two minute pause that I suggested that when you have uh, the desire for food and you don't, and you're not physically hungry, can you take this two, two minute pause? And in the pause, I guide them with breathing and naming what they're feeling and putting a hand on the heart or the face or wherever would feel soothing. Mm. And just to be with what you're experiencing in this moment. Mm. Because the point is to, to calm. You know, it's not an eating problem, it's a calming problem. It is not an eating problem, it's a calming problem. Yeah. Mind blown. Talk about that. Wow. <laughs> so it's really interesting. I've had at the end of each group, I always ask people what they've noticed and what they've learned. And what each group has told me is that if they have treats, if they have dessert, for example, when they're out to dinner and they're in a really good place, they're calm, they're in self, their nervous system is calm, and they're eating from enjoyment, they're loving that dessert. Maybe they'll even share it with whoever they're out with. And they don't get triggered to have more. Hmm. But if we eat it from emotion to try to manage emotions, there's never enough. So I worked with this woman who, uh, this was, she was great. She was a dietitian, And so she knew what to eat, Right. And she had this little kid who we got to know, and um, she, the, the, the child always wanted M&Ms, and she loved her M&Ms. And of course, the food police was afraid that if she had the M&Ms, that she would continue to eat more and more and more. So we, got, we talked with the food police, and we talked with, 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 with the little one, and the food police said, well, I can't let you have them because you never stop. Right? Mm -hmm. And the little one said, Yeah, but that's because you never let me have them. Well, of course, I'm going to eat them all. You know, I'm going to eat more and more and more. So, self talked to each of the parts and they made a deal that uh, the food police would let her have a, you know, those little bags that you get for, you can get for Halloween and stuff, right? Yeah. Would have a little bag every night. And she would only eat the one bag. And then the, the food police would feel comfortable in letting her have it the next night and the next night and the next night. Wow. Yeah. What's weird about that, that sounds like freedom to me. Yes. And she loved it. And, and then, of course, it made it. Then she was able to eat it slowly because she knew that she was going to, she wanted to save it because she only had this one little bag, but she could have it the next day and the next day. What about, you talked a little bit about this with the drinking the water. What about the idea of the sugar is addictive? Okay. I think that there are some of us who have sugar sensitivity. I'm, I include myself. I do have a sugar sensitivity to it. And so people who have a sugar sensitivity say, I can never eat sugar because then I can't stop. And I'm never sure if that's really true or if it's because they're afraid that they won't let themselves have it again. So the, deal, mm. this, the, the experiment I suggest that they try is one that I've used for myself, is that, first of all, you never eat sugar unless your blood sugar is even. So if you're eating sugar in the middle of the day when you're hungry, your blood sugar is going to go up and then it's going to plummet and then you're going to need more and you're on the roller coaster. But if your blood sugar is even, sort of like, you know, when you go out for dinner and you have dessert, right, your blood sugar is even, then you're able to manage some sugar for some of us. And so that's one piece. Another piece is you, for, to not let it become a habit. So for some of us, if we have it one day, no big deal. If we have it the next day, and the next day, now we have that, that uh, craving for it because it becomes a habit. 
I mean, if you were to take a bath every night and the bath and the hot water heater was broken, right? You would feel this uncomfortable feeling. Yeah. You couldn't get your bath because that's right. craving that comes up. So it's about learning to, and when craving comes up, can we be with it? Can we name it mm. and breathe with it? I feel you. I mean, we know that feelings make their way through the nervous system in 90 seconds if we don't uh, fuel them with thoughts, right? Mm, okay. So notice the craving. Notice what that feels like in your body. Craving, craving, is that what's here? Yes. Breathe. See if you can hold yourself in that. Yeah, that feels uncomfortable. And you can do some tapping. You know, tapping is really great for, for working with cravings. Yes. Okay. So let's talk about, so I want to talk about tapping, but I'm going to pause you for a second because what came up for, for me when we're talking about craving is it's almost like this impulsive part says I have to hurry up. Like yesterday mm -hmm. I wanted a peppermint mocha latte. Uh -huh. So I really wanted that. I thought about it all morning. I mm -hmm. went and got it. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, but I have a part when we're talking about- It was about amazing. Can I interrupt you for just a second? Yeah. It was amazing because it was exactly what you wanted. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Keep going. Yeah. No, it was. And I think I did like, um, I really enjoyed it. So it didn't feel mm -hmm. like impulsive mm -hmm. or it was exactly what I wanted. And you know what's so funny is today I thought, oh, I should get another one. And then I was like, but I don't, I don't want one like I did yesterday. Like yesterday uh, I really wanted one. Tammy, that's perfect. That is perfect. Yes. Because then it's coming from, it's a, it's a match. It's, it's from the inside, mm. you know, rather than just from, come from a thought. Janine Roth tells a story exactly like that of a woman who wanted this particular ice cream. She, she convinced her husband to drive her to get this ice cream, homemade ice cream that was 10 miles away. And she said it was unbelievable, sort of like your, your, your latte. And then the next week she happened to be in the area. So she did what most of us did. She got another ice cream and she thought they changed the recipe because it wasn't right. It wasn't exactly what she wanted. That's amazing. That's amazing. When I've done that with like the chocolate chip cookie, like, okay, don't get the cho chocolate chip cookie, get the kale salad or whatever, but then I'll eat the kale oh. salad and then I'm going to eat, now I'm going to eat 10 chocolate chip cookies because that's what uh -huh. I really wanted. Of course. Nothing wrong with your having the chocolate chip cookie. You know, it's giving permission. Do I really want it? Yeah. How is it trying to help? Oh, it's real. Is it trying to help because there's an emotion here that I'm trying to manage? Right. Is there anything else that I can do to help that, to be with that emotion, to breathe, to calm, to hand on heart? Um, but if it's really coming from, this is a taste or right, a texture that I want, great. Well, and that's, that sounds very different than I have a craving and it's impulsive. I don't even want to let myself think about it because if I let myself think about it, then I'm going to stop. Like there's going to be another part that's going to come in and be like, no way, you're not allowed to have that. Mm -hmm. And so I almost have to be like, no, 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 no. I'm going to immediately go to the store and buy the box of cookies and eat the whole box of cookies. And I'm not going to let any other, it's almost like tunnel vision. Like mm -hmm. tunnel vision, and I'm not going to let any other voices come in because they're going to stop me. <laughs> yeah. And I want to be stopped. I want to eat no. the whole box of cookies. Of course. Of course. Yeah. I'm going to give a, a, a resource for people to, um, I don't know if it's on YouTube or Vimeo, but it's called A Woman of a Certain Age. Google it. It is okay. very fun. It's nine minutes long. Um, so tell me about, oh, so the, the other thing I wanted to say about sugar is it sounds like, I feel like I definitely have a sugar addiction. Once, like, mm -hmm. If I'm out to dinner and then I have the sugar at night, like out to dinner, sometimes mm -hmm. when I come home, I'll raid the refrigerator. And I don't know mm -hmm. if that's because of like the sugar addiction or if there's a part of me that says, oh, you're not going to let yourself eat this tomorrow, so you have to eat it all right now. And I'm not uh -huh. sure. I'm actually not sure what it is. Do you know what I mean? Are you willing to experiment? Definitely. I love the idea of experimenting. I, I love that, that, that idea that like I can experiment and then that's, that slows me down right there. So then I can pay attention to what's going on in going on inside. Sure. Tammy, let me ask you another question. When you eat the, when you have the dessert, how do you eat it? 
And how do you talk to yourself while you're at, eating? At the restaurant or at my at the house? Restaurant. At the restaurant. I'm probably eating it at the restaurant because I'm with people. So I'm probably eating it slowly. I'm enjoying it. I'm Great. I'm socializing. So I'm probably talking about it. And it's mm-hmm. like this very satisfying experience. It is. Okay. Great. And do you believe you can have it again? Whenever you what, really want it? Well, <laughs> mm, I don't know. Okay, so when you come home, so you've had a great dessert, and when you come home, the thought of wanting something is there again. So would you be willing to take the pause and get curious about it? Yeah, I think there's a part of me that says definitely, but there's another part that says, but if you pause and get curious, then you're not going to let yourself eat it. And do you want to eat it whenever the thought there may be a part of you that wants to eat it whenever the thought comes you know the 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 part the impulsive part but is there a part of you that wants to eat it only when it really you know for you it's on a seven to ten or an eight to ten or a six whatever you decide is your criteria or do i really want it how is this trying to help My, my 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 one of the lines that i give a lot is How is this food trying to help? What am I hungry for? Yeah. And just be curious. I love that because it takes away the shame, you know, the critical voices inside, but also the history. I think, I mean, I don't know how many women and men too have a history of dieting and Mm. diet thoughts and, and, parents putting you on diets, all that stuff. So I don't know how much of it is like when I come home after the restaurant experience, you know, how much of those thoughts around, you know, what is the food trying to do for me and how is it trying to help me? Like how much of that is loaded with stuff, parts of my exiles that have burdens from the past. Okay. Does yeah. that make sense? Yes. Yes. So getting to being curious and asking questions. Who's here? Yes, yes. Who wants like this? That. Who wants this treat right now? Yeah. Yeah, and that um, that feels so much more compassionate to my body and my whole my whole system. Mm-hmm. So how does tapping fit in? So tell me about tapping and how does it fit into this? Tapping is a great stress reliever. Have you ever done it? I have, yeah. So it's the EFT tapping, right? I mean, I don't yes. know if there's different. T- I don't really know well, much about it, but I have done EFT it. EFT came, yeah. EFT came from thought field therapy. Okay. Uh, it's a, a, a lot more complicated, and EFT made it made it much more simple. And uh, for those people who don't know what EFT is, it's um, it's basically <laughs> it's sort of an acupressure technique. So in Chinese medicine. Um, uh, people believe that, well, we have meridians. We have energy centers through our body, our face and our body. And what an acupuncturist will do is you come in with a symptom and the acupuncturist will figure out where um, where on the meridian and your energy center is the stuckness. So it's about energy not moving through. And with tapping, we tap on uh, particular places on our face and our body while we bring up the negative. And, you know, it's different from um, affirmations where people are just saying the positives. No, we need to bring up the negative. So when I've done this with, uh, with people, I've asked a group sometimes when I've done workshops, I've asked people to bring in their food that is a trigger for them. So, okay, uh, so somebody brings in a brownie. Great. Look at the brownie. And check in with yourself on a scale of zero to 10. How much do you want it? Oh, it's an, it's a nine. Great. Okay. So we're going to tap on our face and body and they follow me as we're talking about how much we want the, 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 uh, the brownie. It's smooth and creamy and it t- I love that chocolate and all the different things that you want about it. All the things which the part of us are telling us not to let ourselves think about, but this is what's here. Mm, Bring yeah. up what's here. So how it feels and but I can't have it. I won't be able to stop. It'll make me feel so good, so calm, so happy. 
and I'll guide them. And, and I deserve to be happy. I want to be happy. Brownies are the only thing that can make me happy. Is that true? And then I deserve to be happy. I want to be happy. I choose to be happy. We stop tapping, check in with themselves. They're feeling calm. They're feeling happier. How strong is the craving? It's down. Mm. Because we've acknowledged how it's trying to help mm. what we want from the brownie. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, uh, I feel like I just walked through that with you because as soon as you started describing the brownie, I started picturing this <laughs> budgy, amazing brownie. And my instant thought was I want a half a pan of brownies. That was my instant, like, I want a half Interesting. a pan. I know, because right? Because the belief that you wouldn't be satisfied unless you had half the pan. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? I remember going to a, a meditation retreat and I was sitting next to the person who was, was giving the retreat and they um they brought brownies actually to the to the table and I took one and I offered it to the, the woman who was running the retreat and I will never forget I'll try to describe it in a way that, that so people can, can imagine it and she took a piece of the brownie and like in slow motion she brought it to her nose and you could see this look of joy in anticipating and she smelled it and she you could you could see the oh the satisfaction from the smell and then she put it in her mouth and how slowly she savored it and the i i was just in awe of watching this and she was so satisfied with that mm. one piece and after that there was a place that I used to go to um, for lunch sometimes, and they had these brownies that I loved, and I would buy a brownie, and so I would eat a brownie. And then I decided, how do you know that you need the whole brownie? Wow. So I started cutting it in quarters and freezing each of the quarters except for the one, and then eat that quarter the way that this woman ate her, her piece of brownie. And I was just as satisfied with the quarter. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> well, and what a completely different experience. So what's coming up for me is what a completely different experience. And then I was also thinking, well, you're eating from a different part. You're the part of me that says eat the whole pan or eat half the pan. Mm -hmm. That's a different part that has different needs and is trying to help me differently than if I ate it in self and I ate it like the meditation lady did. Like I that is a great point. Yes. Yeah, and so and then so then those those that part needs something from me, something different. Like what you're asking is like, what does that part need? Can I slow down enough to listen in to what mm -hmm. part's coming up, and then what does that part need? Yes. Because you talk about food that way. Like, oh, one of the things I love that you said is. Um, you talk about different sub personalities and then you talk about uh, the dieter, which I mm -hmm. thought was fascinating to think mm -hmm. that I have a part that's a dieter mm -hmm. and I totally do. And then you have a part that's the one who eats. And I was yes. like, Oh, so I have a dieter and then I have a one who eats. You're talking about the article that I sent you. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I just so resonated with that. You know, we all have mm -hmm. a critic that is, you know, and, and sort of sure. shame. Mm -hmm. Um, and but the critic is trying to help too. Definitely, definitely, yeah. I had a client who once asked her critic if it would be kinder because it just made her feel bad. And she developed a totally different relationship with her critic. Isn't that sweet? That is really sweet. Well, and that idea that, right, that if I eat the half of, I mean, I have a critic that's up right now by just saying I want to eat the half a pan of brownies. Like just <laughs> saying it. <laughs> and is there a part that's very proud of you for being, for outing yourself? Yeah. <laughs> that's true. I do feel pretty good. Normal about that. and normalizing, you know. Yeah, it's I don't know that I would. I would have been able to do that ten years ago. I wouldn't have been able. I don't know that I've even been able to talk to you, to be completely honest. Really? About it. Yeah. What would have, What would have gotten in the way? What would have made it hard? Like it ha it's a feeling of, um, 
I think there's a part of me that's like, uh, I mean, this is what I want. I'm going to say it this way, and I feel terrible saying it, but this is what's coming up. It's like a part of me that's like a fat girl, but doesn't want anyone to know she's a fat girl. So we've never <sighs> talk about it. We never talk about food. We don't eat in front of people. Like so we <sighs> never. It, so then, so then it's not. People don't know. Like I'm, I'm a fat girl, but I don't know that I'm. I won't tell. It's somehow this sort of shame. Yeah around it. Does that make sense? That that's just yes. what came up in my head. Yes. I've never heard that terminology before, but. So there is a part of you who believes she is a fat girl and not deserving of treats. Well, more like, um, more like a fat girl, but doesn't want anyone to know. <laughs> doesn't yeah. want anyone to know she's a fat girl. So she's of never going to talk about it or she would well, never. Does that make right. sense? Like she of would course, never that's talk why we wear blood. We wear blood. We wear black, right? Can't show. We can't can't wear colors or right. And bigger clothes. Like I remember at a certain point in my life. I'm thinking of like high school when I really struggled with my weight. I wore well, and this was like the 80s and 90s, so it was good. You could have really big hair and really big clothes <laughs> and like stirrup pants. <laughs> Do you remember that? Oh, so yes. that really worked for me because I was I was chunky, and so I would wear really big clothes. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but then so then people wouldn't, you know. So and if people if they ever talked about um, wanting to go on a diet or being on a diet, I wouldn't even, you know, I wouldn't even engage in that conversation. Um, and that's really what this is about: is about are we okay as we are? Can I read um, the last piece of a? Um, I did a talk for Rhode Island College, and this is how I ended it. And it's probably how I'm going to end my last group. And I say, one of the questions I usually ask clients, and I will ask you, how do you want to feel? And how do you want to live? If you could make peace with food, eating what you really want, with enjoyment and satisfaction, no guilt, knowing you can have it again whenever you really want it, not just when the thought occurs, eating from choice, not from habit, eating more mindfully, slowing down, savoring the taste, choosing real foods, whole foods as often as you can for nourishment, and indulging in treats when you really want them, simply for the pleasure of it. Exercising because it makes you feel good, gives you energy, relieves stress, helps you sleep better, and listening to your body for what it needs, rest, touch, water, and using these guidelines as guidelines, not rules, knowing that you and me and everyone else will fall back into old default during times of stress and fatigue. And when we do, to forgive ourselves for our humanness and just let it go. What size would you end up? You would end up at your natural body weight at the age that you are at. And would you be willing to accept that, that natural body weight? And I tell them that I really like this message from Hillary Canavy, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, and Dave, Dana Sturdivant. They, um, they have a concept called body trust. This is not about trying harder. This is about trying different. You've been investing in a failed paradigm, the diet paradigm. Making peace with food and your body is about making peace with yourself, and it's about owning your own life. And I ask them, are you willing to stop the battle? Mm. Are you willing to try to accept yourself just as you are? That's beautiful. That's really beautiful. That's such a different way of thinking and feeling and treating ourselves than the diet mentality that we've all been raised in and we've all been, our culture talks about, like that's, sure. that's almost, that sounds like the opposite of diet mentality. Right. Well, diet mentality was, was given to us by advertising because they wanted to make us feel like there's something wrong with us so they could sell us what they wanted to sell us. Yeah. And then we twist ourselves into pretzels trying to create a body that may be the cultural ideal, but it's not how our body was designed. Yeah. 
can we talk a little bit about body image then? Because I think that's something sure. that is, t- I mean, obviously is tied to it, but something that I think is really hard, especially if you've gained and lost weight and gained and lost weight. Sometimes sure. I, I have no idea what I look like. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. I have no yeah. idea. <laughs> So sometimes sometimes I think I'm thin and sometimes I think I'm fat and that could be in five minute differences. Okay. So here's, so here's, here's an experiment for you. Cause I remember asking this question. I I think it was Marsha Hutchinson. I went to a workshop years ago and I said, why is it that I can look in the mirror one day and I think I look okay. And then the next day I think I'm huge. I mean, I know I haven't gained 30 pounds in a day. Right. Yeah. And she said, what are you thinking about before you look in the mirror? the second time. How is your body, in, I mean, it, it may be the, the angle, it may be how you're feeling about yourself. Our body image is not the same as our body. Yeah, that's, that is interesting. Like my body image is not the same as my body. Right. There was a program and I wish we could, I wish it was still on, what was the name of it? There was this, this guy who, um, is women would get invited to do a makeover, okay? And they, he had them stripped down into their, their underwear. He was a gay guy, so it was, it made, it, yeah. he made them very, very comfortable. It was, it was, this was a British show. He had other women who were of all different sizes and shapes and um, also in their underwear. And he asked the woman who was invited the guest to put herself where she thought she belonged as far as size went. She was so wrong. Every single woman he invited in was so wrong. Our distortions are so, we're so distorted with our body image. And so it's interesting, my my last group that I'm gonna be doing on, on Monday night is both body image and also reconnecting to our bodies. Because what, what I really hope people get and what's been such a gift for me is there's such wisdom in our bodies. You know, if we listen to our bodies, they know what foods they need. They know how much. They know when a person doesn't feel comfortable, that, they, that, they, that you don't like this person. You know, yeah, yes, they know right. you have to be nice to everybody. Yeah, yeah. We have these, these, you know, the uh-oh feeling that comes, our body wisdom is so amazing and we learn how to disconnect from it. And I think we learn to disconnect, and I wrote about this in the article, I think, because to, if, if, if when we're growing up, we have a choice between knowing what we know and conforming and being accepted by our families, we're gonna disconnect from our body knowing in order to be, to, to keep the connection with our parents because that's our safety. Yes. Yeah. That is so this, true. Yes. So this is about reconnecting to ourselves. Yeah. And our, yeah. through our bodies. I think it's interesting if, I don't know if this was your experience or not, but for me, I think this is what I'm saying that like 10 years ago, I couldn't have had this conversation is that I couldn't tell you what my body felt 10 years ago. Like I, 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 I was like, I'm kind of doing a chopping motion ah, I was so yeah yep. right yep. so um you know I wouldn't have been because I hated my body because I was like fat girl but pretending I'm not fat girl yep. um so you know I wasn't I wouldn't have been able to do that so I wouldn't mm. have, I wouldn't have been able to tell you what my body needed or wanted or felt or you know I, w- I was definitely one of those people that could not connect with body like where so what helped body? you connect what helped you connect to your body because I think that could be instructive for for people who are still there yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think it was probably lots of things. I think that I had a friend. This is what this is what came to my mind. I moved here. I moved to New Hampshire, and I had a friend that loved going. To, to, she was skinny, so I always thought that only fat people worked out because you only worked out because you need to lose weight. <laughs> no. Oh heavens! So I had a, a thin. She's still my friend, um, and she's really thin. And or she's she looks great. She's uh-huh. healthy, but she's thin. She's little, and um, she went. That's to the, her natural body size. Yeah, her natural body type. But she's just a thin person, yeah. mm-hmm. and um, but she went to the gym all the time. And she would say like, she's another. She's a therapist, and so we were mm-hmm. therapists together. And so she would say, 
um, you know, having a stressful day. I can't wait to get to the gym. So she started talking about in this really positive way of like, <sighs> this will help me. And so then I think I started going to the gym because we had moved here and I'm like, oh, that's what people do. And there's a time in my life I would have never gone to a gym because I'm too fat. Fat girls don't go to the gym. So I think it was sort of like kind of social pressure, but like this good pressure. And then I would just kind of walk on the treadmill. And then I think I started doing the elliptical. And then what I remember made a huge difference is one day I didn't go to the gym And I don't know what I thought, but I was like, I think I'm going to go for a run, which is something I'd never done in my life. And I went for a run and I ran three miles and I was like, who am I? (laughs) Like that. And that was like, that was, and I ended up running. There's, we live in New Hampshire and there's amazing uh, race series. So right before I had my son, I did this year long like race series and that was a huge deal for me because that's not, I mean, talk about being connected to your body. Like when I'm running, I'm completely yes. connected to my feet. My, te- my whole body is connected. Yes. Yeah. And it's so funny. You said this. Um, I wrote this down too. Um, if we do one thing, then others fall into place. Yes. And I think that's what happened with me for running is I mm. ended up losing a bunch of weight. I think at that point mm. I didn't need to, I don't, who knows? I don't even know. (laughs) But I think I did lose like maybe 20 pounds, but I was not focused on food. Yeah. Yeah. Because it was like, well, I went for a run. I feel good. I'm more connected to my body. And so then your body, your body's then probably telling you what it wants and what it doesn't want. Yeah. And I'm more connected to it, which I had never been, I had never been before. And so I don't think people need to like start going running and, um, but I think being in our bodies, I think moving is really important. moving. I think that's what it is. So I think yoga has done the same thing for me because now I'm open to all that stuff and I do yoga too. And yeah, so yeah, it's just a connection to my body. And actually, I think because the food had been, there've been so many messed, messed up things with food, which now I know through IFS is that those were parts helping me. Mm-hmm. So I just had such a, you know, we would say like a bad relationship with food, but it really, it was just those parts that mm-hmm. were trying to help me. And that was just- In the only way they knew how, yeah. Yeah, and what was accessible to me. Right. I'm too much of a good girl. So food is like such a good girl addiction. Well, I do the same thing with alcohol with people. Well, it makes it would make so much sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny with alcohol because um, I have a good friend that has a hard time with alcohol. And it was funny. We had this this thought happen the other day. Was It was, it was in the summer, actually. And we were both drinking, like, spiked seltzers. And I think I drank, like, half of one. And I was just like, whatever. I moved on to something else. And it was such an aha moment for both of us because she was like, she could never – she'd have to have that one. And then she'd eat three more. But I'm like, right, but if that was a cookie – I eat that cookie, I eat your cookie, and I need five more. Like I could care less about the alcohol, but and she could care less about the cookie. Ah, uh, but Isn't that interesting. I remember, I, it is. I remember working with a woman who had was uh, a little worried about her drinking, and I asked her if she could do mindful drinking. And so, uh, this was the experiment: was every sip would be a conscious sip. She can have as many sips as she wants, as long as each one was conscious. And that she also drink water in between. And she was amazed how satisfied she was with, wow, you know, with less. I love that. Well, the other thing that you say is put down your fork. Yes, yes. On the CD, there's a, a guided, um, a conscious eating guided imagery. You know, I guide people through, through an eating experience. Um, so yeah, put it, well, because if you have your fork ready, or if you have the cookie ready, if it's in your hand ready, I mean, how do the French eat? You know, remember the, the book? Uh, yeah, yes. the fat, right? They eat very rich foods, right? Yeah. And, but they're fresh and they're homemade. And, well, I don't know if they're all homemade. Maybe <laughs> the cannolis are not homemade. Well, they're made by somebody. But, um, but they, they're small portions. And if you have a croissant, you don't take the croissant and put it in um, and you hold it the whole time. No, you take a piece, of, mm. you know, and what if we did that with bread? Oh, wow. Yeah. The other thing that you said was we, that we usually are like the diet mentality is we eat for the scale. So, mm-hmm. but, but now your approach is to eat for body satisfaction. And I think yeah, that's mouth, they, well, mouth, mouth satisfaction, mouth satisfaction. Okay. And, okay. And, and also body satisfaction. Do I want something heavy? Do I want something light? You know, trying to get the right match. 
right match and you said it was, you know, that that latte because it was exactly what you wanted. You know, I uh, so do you want something liquid? Do you want something solid? Do you want something chewy? Do you want something creamy? Right. What will give you what kind of taste do you want? Do you want something sweet or salty? Do you want something spicy? What kind of spice? See if you can get the exact match because then you will be satisfied. And if you eat it slowly and really love it without all those messages of, you know, you shouldn't be eating it, but really loving it, you'll be satisfied with less. What do you do for people that say, I'm so cut off that I don't even know what I want? I couldn't tell you. I couldn't right. tell you what I wanted. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, they probably know what they don't want. Mm, okay. Yeah. Or they can go to pull up some restaurant um, menus. What would appeal to you? I asked the question and then I thought like, well, I wonder if you use, use your imagination. Like, okay, let me imagine eating spaghetti. Hmm. That's not, yes. you know what I mean? It sort of just use your imagination, but I, I don't, yeah. I don't know that like the diet mentality is we don't even ask ourselves what we want. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that's part of the habit is the right. habit is like I pull through McDonald's on the way home and get as much as I can right. because I'm stressed out or whatever. And yeah, no, I'm not against eating for, for health. When I ask people, you know, when you go out to, to eat, look at the menu, see what appeals to you and choose what's healthiest from the things that appeal to you. I love that. So I'm, I'm kind of, I'm doing that first. It's like, what's appealing to me? If spaghetti is appealing to me, okay, that's yeah. what I really want. But right. then there's some healthier choices with spaghetti or whatever. Yeah. And, and if you would be satisfied with the healthier choice, by all means have it. But if you would feel deprived, then don't do it. Just get the sketty. Yep. Just get the sketty, but then eat it differently. That's the other thing that you said that I loved because you also talk about tracking. Um, mm -hmm. And I think about this idea of 10 years ago. I don't really know what happened 10 years ago, but I'm just going to keep saying that. <laughs> I had a friend that was a health coach and she needed like some clients. And so she, for, um, to do a, like a certificate program or mm -hmm. something. And I was like, well, you know, there's a part of me that wants to help. So I'm like, sure, I'll help you. And so she's like, okay, the first thing you need to do is track what you eat for three days. And I was like, mm, no, because <laughs> 10 years ago, I'm like, there's no way I'm tracking that. But so you have people track what they're eating and then- you And nobody also wants to do it. No, nobody wants to do it. I have some major parts reacting to it. Yes. But one thing that I thought was brilliant was not just what they eat, but how they eat. Oh, yeah. So on the, so if this is in the back of my book, I have this eating chart, right? And the questions are, and it's not to change anything because we're, we're being scientists. We're really trying to be curious about, yeah. so what prompts the desire for food? Is it physical hunger? And if it's physical hunger, checking what on the level scale of one to 10, how hungry are you? Five meaning neither hungry nor full, which the French, by the way, uh, call j'ai femme, I no longer have hunger. Oh, isn't that interesting? We I like it. Yeah. Well, so what prompted the desire for food? Was it a, was it hunger? Was it a thought? Was it that it's a, it's a beckoner, you know, you, you passed a, a, a bakery and all of a sudden you want a chocolate chip cookie. What, so what prompted it? And what did you, how hungry were you? Um, what did you, what did you eat? How did you eat it? How full were you after eating? So that you can see that if I shoveled it in, I probably got too full afterwards because I didn't recognize if you eat, we eat too fast. And slowing down is such a major piece of this because if we eat too fast, we don't recognize when our, our belly is getting full. Right, yeah. And, and, um, and then how did you feel afterwards? So, I mean, I'll give the example of when I'm doing a talk, I don't want to be too hungry. I don't want to be too full because how do I want to, how do I want to feel? So much of this is about how do you want to feel? Yeah. You know, certain foods will make you feel logy. If you eat a real carb heavy um, meal, you're going to feel logy. And that may be how you want to feel, which is great. But if you want to have your, your, uh, be able to think, you know, like I wanted to be able to do with talking with you, I wanted my mind, to, my brain to be working. I'm not going to eat a lot of carb. I'm going to eat protein and vegetables um, and fats, and that's going to give, I'm going to have some, some brain power and I'm not going to eat too much because I'm going to just start to feel logy. You know, it's, it's fascinating is that 
diet mentality, I'm going to keep saying that, but diet mentality, we would never even think to ask that question. I would never even think to ask, how is this food going to make me feel? How do I want to feel? And how's this food going to make me feel? It would never even dawn on me to ask myself that. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. And I love that it's like an experiment that's noticing, it's compassionate, it's curious, it's gentle. Yes. And then I want to make sure to say, when we're experimenting, we're going to fall back into old patterns all the time. Yeah. And I had a client came in and said, I can't do this because I just, um, I keep, I, I keep messing up. It's like, that's fine. That's information. Oh, Tell it's information. Yeah. Yeah. So let's get, let's rewind the tape Yeah. and understand what happened. Was it that your blood sugar was too low so that you ate too fast because your your blood sugar was low. Um, was it because you know were you too were you tired? What 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 prompted the falling back into the into the old mm. eating pattern? Now rewind to the end, and what could you have done differently that would have helped? So because that helps us um, in the future. And can we not beat ourselves up for it? Just get the learning and let it go. I love it. Mm. What a gift you're giving people. I love that you, yeah, that I, I love that you're, you're putting it out there into the world and it's so needed and it's, I really appreciate it. I appreciate you coming on the podcast. Oh, this has been fun. It's, it's been so been fun. Really great to talk to. Oh, thanks. <laughs> so if they want my website, it's barbaraholtzman.net. They want to Perfect. email me, it's barbara at barbaraholtzman.net. And then um, if, if you weren't a therapist and you know, running all these groups and an author, what would you be doing? I am living the life I want to live. So, which is pretty wonderful. It's great to be in your 60s. So. <laughs> Something to look forward to. Um, so I work part-time and I love that. So I would, I think I'm, I'm probably always going to do some work. Yeah. So what do you do fun? What do you do for, oh, for fun? fun? Well, yeah. well, I've become an activist. So that's, that's really been, and I can tell you about that if you're interested. And I, I actually go to the senior center for classes. <laughs> um, well, I used, to, I used to try Zumba because I love to dance. I love yeah. it. It's a nice thing. And I love all that kind of stuff. And I hurt myself. And then I found this class. I have a fabulous teacher. And so I take Zumba and Pilates and strength training and, um, and stretching. And, 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 and I, I, I mean, I've always liked hiking and biking and, and kayaking and that kind of thing. Um, but I had a friend who got me into exercising. I was lying on the couch one day, with an old friend from when I lived in Atlanta. And, and I was talking about it. I was just feeling low-key. And she, I use that word a lot. And she said, um, you, know, you know, the physics um, theorem, uh, an object in motion tends to stay in motion, an object at rest tends to stay at rest. So I was yep. just, you know, on the couch reading and complaining, you know, I was just telling her that I was feeling low. And she said, get up. What do you mean? Get up. I stood up and she said, just move. Mm. I couldn't believe how different that felt. Mm. And soon after that, I discovered this class at the senior center, which I always thought they were too old, you know, that those, yeah. those, when, you're, when you're in your 80s. But this woman really works us pretty hard. Uh, it was at a pace that I could dance. And so I have really gotten into it. So what do I do? So I, 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 so I do all of my sports and I sing um, in a choir and I'm uh, involved with my spiritual community and I take a, I'm involved in this um, wonderful program, Live Conscious program, um, wearing my bracelet that says um, micro, uh, microdosing mindfulness as a reminder to look for the moments of mm. awe, of gratitude and mm. um, and I'm, the work that I'm doing, I've, I've just gotten very, do you know Joanna Macy's work? She's been an activist for many, many years. And she, I, I started reading her book, Active Hope. And got, it was like exactly what I needed of how to, to move this, this our, our society, our culture, our world in the direction that we need to without getting burned out. And I got so excited by it that um, getting the Unitarian Universalist uh, congregation and the climate change group. We're going to bring in some people who are going to 
we're going to train us on it, and then we're going to do a um, follow it up with with a book group on active hope. And so I'm I'm just doing a, I've been doing a lot a lot of activism, which is feels like that's my the other reason that I'm here. <laughs> I love that. That's great. Barbara, thank you so much for meeting with me and sharing yourself and your story and your expertise. And uh, this was really great. So thank you so much. Thank you. You are the best interviewer. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that means a lot to me because I know you've been, e- you've been interviewed by a lot of people. I so have. I have. Yeah. yeah. That means a lot to me. I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take that in. Well, enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy the weekend. Thank you. you too. Thanks for hanging out today. If you like this episode, make sure you subscribe. And if you really like this episode, share it with a friend and leave a review. You can follow me on Instagram at IFS Tammy and join our community on Facebook at the One Inside Podcast. Talk to you next time. episode was sponsored by Brighter Vision. What's the point of having a beautiful website if it doesn't attract the clients you want to see? As the worldwide leaders of website design for therapists, Brighter Vision sees this issue happen way too often. A nice looking website doesn't equate to a successful website. The truth is, your current website might even be turning off potential clients. That's where Brighter Vision comes in. Brighter Vision's team of website designers will create a website that is centered around attracting and retaining your ideal client so that you can have a nice looking website as well as a successful one. Better yet, Brighter Vision is offering $100 off exclusively for listeners of the One Inside podcast. To take advantage of this offer, simply go to brightervision.com backslash inside. Again, that's brightervision.com backslash inside.